You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for June 23rd, 2023. This week, starting heart failure meds in the hospital, Impella, testosterone, and colgicine. First, though, an announcement. Next week, TWIC podcast takes a Friday off to celebrate U.S. independence from British monarchy. The Mandrola family, ranging from age 2 to 86 years, will spend the weekend at the lake in rural Kentucky. And if you think I'm a beginner in statistics, you should see me try to park a boat in a dock. It's also next weekend, the start of my favorite sporting event, the Tour de France, and I can't wait to watch. Okay, first topic, starting heart failure meds in the hospital. Jack has published an observational study that describes what is happening in certain hospitals regarding heart failure medications. First off, I want to say that this is a great use of observational data. Science tells us what we can do, trials tell us what we should do, and registries and observational data tells us what we are doing. So this is a good use, good on Arthur's, good on Jack. The goal of this analysis of about 50,000 patients from 160 hospitals who were signed up to be in the Get With The Guidelines registry was to compare the actual versus maximal prescribing of evidence-based medical therapy for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And the results, on admission, about 15% of patients were receiving all indicated heart failure meds. And overall, the mean number of recommended meds was 3.9. Now, this is the maximal use based on what's in the database. Now, the actual number of medicines used was 2.1 medicines on admission, and that actually increased to 3.0 on discharge. So, said another way, one in six patients were on the full regimen of evidence-based meds, and this increased to one in three on discharge. Some more good news was that over the time of the study, 2017 to 2020, there was a steady increase in heart failure medicine initiation. Also, all four classes of medicines had an increase in initiation. But on the downside, women were less likely to have, quote, appropriate medication initiation, and rural hospitals did worse than urban hospitals. Now, the authors also note in a very negative way that patients with comorbidities are less likely to receive full heart failure meds, and I'll talk more about that in the comments. So first, I really like covering observational studies that don't try to make comparisons, so this is really happy that Jack published this and the authors wrote this. But I have to say, as I've said many times before, I really worry about this movement, this religion, this rush to medicate patients quickly in the hospital with heart failure. My worries relate not to any concerns about the evidence for heart failure therapy, except, of course, Secubitril Valsartan, but rather the translation of this evidence to patients who are not in clinical trials. Whenever possible and consistent with the patient's goals, I always go full gas on the big four classes of heart failure meds. But you have to remember basic principles of evidence, right? First, most of the evidence for heart failure medications comes from trials in stable outpatients. This is a lot different from trying to initiate medicines in acutely ill older patients who are in the hospital. These patients are much more vulnerable to harm, and they have more competing causes of bad outcomes. For instance, many patients that I see who have heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction 
have it because they went into atrial fib and they have a rapidly conducting ventricular rate. These patients do best with short-acting beta blockers and digoxin. So in a spreadsheet and in my quality measures, I look to be a failing doctor. For instance, many patients have heart failure because of infection. These patients often have soft blood pressure or renal insufficiency, and doctors are rightly nervous about starting patients on full gas, evidence-based heart failure medications. Then many patients have comorbid conditions, and by definition, evidence-based meds may not apply here because these sorts of patients were not commonly enrolled in trials. Now, the authors of this observational analysis cite the STRONG HF trial, and I have lauded STRONG HF. It's a great trial. It supports rapid titration of heart failure medicines, but few medical centers that I have seen even have a fraction of the setup and, and, and backup needed to do strong HF-like rapid titration of heart failure medicines. Now, while I agree that the, a heart failure hospitalization is an opportunity to improve care, I worry that this get-with-the-guidelines enthusiasm has a risk of turning doctors into prescribing robots, and that is a bad idea. We must always remember Goodhart's Law. And that is, once a measure becomes a target, it loses its effectiveness as a measure. All right, second topic is going to be Impella, and I want to make a brief note. I normally on this podcast shun brand names because industry needs no marketing help. But in the case of Impella, this would mean saying percutaneous microaxial left ventricular assist device each time I mention a device. So I'm going to make an exception. Now, four weeks ago, I covered a paper published in Jack, describing use of Impella 5 series for support during VT ablation. This was a paper from Cleveland Clinic, high-level operators. It was a non-random comparison using a historical control, but the bottom line was that success rates in the two groups for VT ablation were no different, but complications were much higher in the Impella-assisted VT ablation, like 29% versus 2.5%. Then, two weeks ago, I covered a story about ABL Med recalling nearly 500 of its Impella 5 Series devices due to purge fluid leaks. On both these occasions, I opined a bit about the lack of RCT level evidence supporting the use of this device, the wide variation in its use, the financial incentives for its use, the low bar it reached in getting approval, and worrisome signals from the observational data thus far. Well, here we are again. JAMA Cardiology has published another observational study, this one with very impressive methods. The study comes to a somewhat unusual conclusion, so stay tuned. Now, the analyses come from the Beth Israel Boston group led by Dr. Robert Ye, the first author, Zayed Almerzouk, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Now, I use the plural analyses here because while this was one manuscript, they really used four different ways to compare outcomes in patients who had Impella use for cardiogenic shock. Their data source was a Medicare fee-for-service claims database, and these were patients who had AMI, acute MI-related cardiogenic shock from 2015 to 2019. And so think about this. In the database, there were basically two groups, those who had cardiogenic shock, who a doctor decided to use the device, and those in whom a doctor decided not to use the device. Now, of course, these types of studies are being done because the device was approved without passing muster in an RCT, and I'll return to that, but for now, let's just stay with the paper because it is a very good paper. Now, in much the same way that Brian Nosek famously asked different groups of scientists to analyze one data set, and then the groups chose to analyze that data set in different ways, Dr. Ye and colleagues decided to look at this database and this question in four different ways. They first compared the Impella use versus non-use strategies with a pretty standard propensity matching analysis, and here they used an inverse probability of treatment weighting to try and account for the baseline differences because patients who got Impella, of course, had uh, more sickness. The second way they looked at the data, they used an instrumental variable analysis to try and sort out the baseline differences. Now, I'm no expert, but instrumental variables are have to be relevant, they have to be exchangeable, and they have to have no effect on treatment, and they're hard to find. 
one example of an instrument variable might be like a natural experiment. And in this study, they used a hospital's percentage use of Impella in all cardiogenic shock patients undergoing PCI in the previous two years. The third way they compared the two strategies was with a difference in difference approach. What does that mean? This means they looked at changes in outcome at hospitals whose use of Impella grew very rapidly over time versus outcomes from hospitals that did not increase Impella use over the same time. Now, you've probably guessed here that this is clearly a population type comparison. And so basically, the difference in difference approach acts like a sensitivity analysis for the two previous approaches. And finally, the fourth way they looked at it was the effectiveness of initiating Impella use within the first two days after PCI for the MI. And this approach tries to create a time zero standard because if you include devices placed later, it induces an immortal time bias issue, meaning you have to be alive for those days to get the device. Now, I realize I've just talked a lot about methods and I haven't told you any results. And my AFib doctor translation of all this is that these are four approaches to try and simulate the elegant and ultimate way of knowing things in medicine. That is, you randomize cardiogenic shock patients and count up outcome events, but that hasn't been done. So here are the results. They included about 56,000 patients. These were 73-year-old, mostly male patients with cardiogenic shock. About 17% got an Impella and 83% did not. And of those who did not get Impella, about a third of them got an uh, intraoral balloon pump. So unadjusted, there was a massive 19% higher rate of death in the Impella arm, like 56% versus 38%. Of course, unadjusted comparisons don't tell you anything because their baseline characteristics tables show that patients who received the Impella were much sicker. And that is the core problem they're trying to solve with these fancy four methodologies that I just told you about. So let's see what happens with the variable adjusting techniques. Again, results here are absolute, not relative differences. Now, for the basic propensity matching of variables, Impella use associated with a 15% absolute, 15% higher absolute risk of death uh, than non-use. Now, and these were very tight conference intervals. For the instrumental variable analysis, Impella use associated with a 13% higher risk of death versus non-use. And these were a little bit wider conference intervals. And for the difference in difference analysis, looking at different hospitals, Impella use did not have a higher risk of death, but the conference intervals were very, very wide. And for the grace period analysis, looking at early Impella use, there was an 18% higher rate of death with Impella use, again, with tight conference intervals. So the interpretation of this is that on the surface, you could look at this and say, hey, there's three techniques found strongly negative associations of, with Impella use. The one approach that found no association had the widest conference intervals. And the authors do get around to writing that not one of their analyses found benefit from Impella use. So this is sort of similar trends to many other observational studies that have reported worse outcomes with Impella. But here is the problem, and the authors tell us that, quote, evidence from the data as well as background knowledge regarding drivers of treatment decisions and institutional differences suggest that key assumptions for all approaches likely were strongly violated. Thus, we are not, not confident that any of the statistical estimates summarized above can be given a causal interpretation. My translation is this. Look, we know that doctors decide to use Impella in sicker patients, and no matter the matching techniques, retrospective looks at administrative data are very susceptible to bias. Sicker patients get Impella, and that is why they do worse. So they tried to use different approaches than basic matching, including an instrumental variable and difference in difference analysis among hospitals, and these are novel techniques, but sadly, they found violation of assumptions in the instrumental variable analysis and things like different hospital sizes, uh, teaching status at a hospital, variation in the treatment of minority patients, and in addition, in the difference in difference analysis, wide conference intervals precluded any reliable interpretations. 
Now, here are those interesting conclusions I told you about. Quote, our findings suggest that commonly used observational data sets cannot support a causal interpretation of the estimate produced by different analyses used for the evaluation of impella in cardiogenic shock. Randomized clinical trials will allow valid comparisons across candidate treatment strategies and help resolve ongoing controversies. All right, David Cohen and Manesh Patel, two famous cardiologists, academics, wrote the editorial, and it's very good. You should read it. They laud the authors for doing a far more rigorous than normal observational study. They, too, conclude that some questions can't be answered with observational data, and it seems almost every week here I am saying the same thing. But in this case, there's a bit of a temptation, isn't there? I'm tempted to say, wait a second here. Dr. Bobby Ye's group is one of the best at doing this stuff. They did these incredible analyses, super careful, and three of the four analytic methods suggest serious harm with Impella. And this is similar to other observational studies. So can we then consider the weight of the evidences toward harm? But of course, my friends, you know the answer to that temptation. No, double no. Doctors Cohen and Patel and Ye are correct. In my mind, it doesn't matter if 30 observational studies find harm from Impella. Non-randomized comparisons are just inherently susceptible to the bias of sicker patients getting Impella. The analogy here is hormone replacement therapy for cardiovascular protection in women. There were actually more than 30 observational studies suggesting benefit from HRT or an association. And guess what? The Women's Health Initiative, RCT, showed that they were all biased. What's weird, though, is that the cardiology literature overflows with these sorts of analysis. It's as if academic cardiologists are similar to master's bike racers. We train all winter, every winter, thinking some spring we will ride like a pro, but we never do. It never changes. The fast guys always win. And in academic cardiology, the observational comparisons continue to get done, and no matter the analytic method, bias persists. Now, the main reason to read Drs. Cohen and Patel's editorial is the final two paragraphs where they support their subtitle, which was putting the horse back in front of the cart. They argue, and I say sit down for this, incentivizing the use of RCTs. This quote made me cheer because it is the first policy I would enact if I was in charge. They say to enhance the ability of payers to incentivize performance of clinical trials of approved devices through conditional coverage with evidence generation. And my only change would it be we coverage with evidence generation before a device gets approval. I would say you want us to pay for this device, fine, enroll the patient in a trial. If this was our policy, we would know if Impella helps or harms or does nothing. We would know if left atrial appendage occlusion helped or harmed. We would know the placebo-controlled effect of AF ablation. I just don't understand why we don't do more actual randomized clinical trials before things get enacted and accepted as a therapeutic fashion. Okay, third topic, testosterone. Now, I've never taken testosterone Though amateur bike racers who race for free socks on the weekend are now tested for testosterone as performing enhancing drugs. And everyone I've ever talked to who took testosterone says that it works. Studies done over decades find that it has a clear androgenic effect. You get stronger, you feel younger, and that is no small thing. And as men age, their testosterone levels drop, muscles sag, watts per kilo da go down, the $64,000 question is whether or not men who have low T should take extra T so they feel better. But in the same way we know that testosterone makes for bigger, stronger muscles, more sex drive, and more watts per kilo, we also know that it can increase hemoglobin and increase blood pressure. You could feel stronger and be more apt to have a cardiac event. Last Friday evening, why Friday evening, I don't know, but New England Journal of Medicine published the Traverse Study, a non-inferiority, placebo-controlled RCT 
of testosterone in older men who had pre-existing or high risk of heart disease. Now, to be enrolled, men had to have symptoms and signs of hypogonadism. Now, this included two fasting testosterone levels of less than 300 nanograms per deciliter. And they enrolled more than 5,200 patients to testosterone gel or placebo, and they adjusted the dose carefully to maintain testosterone levels between 350 and 750. Cardiovascular safety endpoints was the first occurrence of a three-component composite endpoint CV death MI or stroke, and they added a secondary endpoint, which included those three plus coronary revascularization. Now, it's a non-inferiority trial for safety, and it required an upper bound of less than 1.5 for the hazard ratio of the primary endpoint. The mean follow-up was 33 months, mean age 63 years old, BMI 35, and the median testosterone level was 227. And the results, 7% of the testosterone group had a primary outcome event, 7.3% in the placebo arm, now that's a hazard ratio of 0.96, but it's not inferiority, so you have to check the 95% conference interval of the hazard ratio. Here, the worst case scenario or upper bound of the conference interval was 1.17, so that's well less than the margin of 1.5. Said another way, the upper bound of the 95% conference interval included a 17% risk increase of cardiovascular events, but that was less than the chosen non-inferiority margin of a 50% increase or 50% worse. So non-inferiority was met. Now, this was done on the intention to treat analysis, and there was a high discontinuation rate, but they also performed robust sensitivity analysis to evaluate treated patients, and that also upheld non-inferiority. The secondary endpoint of the four components, CV death, MI stroke, revascularization, were nearly identical, and there was no significant difference in prostate cancer and only very minor changes in systolic blood pressure. However, there were 14 more VTE events. That's 46% more. There were 12 more PEs in the testosterone group, 47 more non-fatal arrhythmias, 27 more AFib events, and 20 more AKI events in the testosterone group. Another important factor is that figure one shows very strict control of testosterone levels over the trial. I mean, the mean testosterone in the placebo group was 225, and it didn't change. Testosterone levels in the active arm went to about 350, and they decreased a little bit over time, but there were no, there were no patients with very high testosterone levels. And to me, this seems important to have very strict control. So my comments... I am not sure this answers the question of testosterone safety. Now, these were 63-year-old patients studied for two years. I mean, that's not very long. And the upper bound of the hazard ratio included a 17% increase in MACE in just two years. There were more PEs, more arrhythmias, and more AKI events in the testosterone group. Now, plus, these patients were way overweight. The mean BMI was 35. Now, I know, don't beat me up. BMI is not a perfect measure. There may have been a handful of them that could have been bodybuilders, but mostly these were fat old dudes. Now, what if they had lost fat? Here, they might get a boost of testosterone with a decrease in MACE. So the ABV sponsored trial may have checked the regulatory boxes, but I'm not convinced testosterone replacement for a fat 63-year-old men with cardiovascular disease or high risk for cardiovascular disease is a place the medical profession should be going. So I feel the same way here as I do about ablating AFib in patients who have not had attempts at risk factor modification. It's unwise. Many people say, Mandrola, you're a fool. People won't or can't lose weight and get fit. Just ablate them or give them testosterone, etc. And I hear that. I am also a pragmatist, and I practice that way. But, but, doctors still have a respected standing amongst many people. As doctors, we have a chance to help people with our words. Most people will not heed the diet and exercise talk, but some do. And when I ask those who transform their life by exercising and eating better, why they did it, they often say, because my doctor told me I should. 
So two decades on, I still stand by the idea that we should not give up on our chance to heal with words. Now, I suspect some of you will disagree with my stance here. Let me know. Teach me in the comments. Final topic, briefly, colchicine. Now, did you know, I didn't, that colchicine has been used for hundreds of years. It's so old that it was never FDA approved for a formal indication. And that led to a regulatory mess around 2010 in which a single drug company decided to test colchicine formally in a trial, a very small and inexpensive trial, and it garnered formal approval of the brand Colceris for gout. That led to a three-year term of market exclusivity and prohibition of generic sales and a 50-fold increase in price. And for some reason, oral colchicine remains expensive today. Biologically, colchicine has broad anti-inflammatory effects, and we all know that atherosclerotic disease is at least partially an inflammatory disease. Recently, FDA has now approved a lower dose, 0.5 milligrams daily of colchicine, as the first anti-inflammatory drug demonstrated to reduce the risk of MI, stroke, coronary vascularization, and CV death in patients with either known heart disease or high risk for CV disease. Two trials underpin this approval, both published in New England Journal, and let's briefly review. One trial, Colcott in 2019, randomized about 4,700 patients who had had a recent MI to colchicine versus placebo. These were 60-year-old, mostly white men who could not have left ventricular dysfunction. 99% were on statins and dual antiplatelet therapy. And the results over a median follow-up of just 22 months, a primary endpoint of CV death, resuscitated arrest, MI, stroke, coronary vascularization occurred in 5.5 versus 7.1% of the colchicine and placebo group. This is a 1.6% absolute risk reduction corresponding to a hazard ratio of 0.77 or a 23% reduction that was statistically significant, so it's a positive trial. But CV death, S sudden cardiac death, MI, did not differ that much. The composite endpoint was driven mostly by lower rates of urgent revascularization and stroke, although the stroke rates were low. All cause deaths were nearly identical. Adverse events were mostly similar with a slightly more diarrhea and nausea in the colchicine arm. The bigger trial, though, was low doco 2 published a year later in 2020, they randomized 5,500 patients who had chronic CAD, colchicine versus placebo. These were 66-year-old, mostly white men from Australia or Netherlands, 94% on statins. Notable was a run-in period in which 15% of patients did not undergo randomization due to GI causes. And here, over a median follow-up of just 28 months, primary endpoint of CV death, MI, stroke, and coronary vascularization occurred in 6.8 versus 9.6% of the colchicine and placebo groups. So this was a 2.8% absolute risk reduction corresponding to a hazard ratio of 0.69 that was highly significant. Again, another positive trial. But some caveats, CV death rates were low and they were not different. MI was 1.2% less than the colchicine arm. Stroke rates were low and not much different. Again, lower revascularization rates were the main driver of the composite. But death from any cause was non-statistically significantly higher in the colchicine arm. It was 2.6 versus 2.2% in the placebo arm. And this was driven by a 50% higher rate of non-cardiovascular death. So my comments on low-dose colchicine. The drug looks to have a consistent effect. It's a modest reducer of non-fatal cardiac events. Most positive thing I can say is that it works in addition to really good background therapy and the rates of gout were substantially lower in low, do low doco 2. In patients with chronic coronary disease who don't mind taking extra pills to maximally reduce non-fatal events, low dose colchicine is reasonable. And now in addition, when you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves, they seem to be separating over time, so maybe this effect would increase with time, so, sort of like it does with statins. And scientifically, this piques your interest, right, because it's the first anti-inflammatory drug to market for cardiovascular disease. I mean, canakinumab also reduced inflammation in cardiac 
events in the Cantos trial, but the reductions were modest and the company decided not to market the interleukin-1 beta inhibitor. But I'm not too enthusiastic about colchicine. And this is clearly an incremental advance. These were young patients in their 60s and the trials were less than three years. There were no signals of reductions of CV death or death. In fact, the higher death rate in low doco 2 in the colchicine arm is concerning. Now, maybe the 50% higher rate of non-CV deaths was noise, but the conference intervals went from 0.99 to 2.31. Now, I'm sure that there's going to be intense marketing of this drug. There's going to be direct-to-consumer marketing. There'll be drug reps in their offices. And I guess the main thing I would say is I really hope that colchicine does not display statins. Both of these trials studied colchicine in addition to very high rates of statin use. I also suspect that the branded drug is going to be costly. So patients in their late 60s who have established coronary disease and likely other chronic conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, maybe AFib, will have to take oodles of pills. And adding another pill for a 1% to 2% absolute risk reduction of non-fatal events over 2.5 years hardly seems worth the trouble. So that's it for this week in cardiology. I went a little longer this week because next week we get a break for July 4th and then I'm back in two weeks. As always, I'm grateful that you listen. And remember, if you like this podcast, take the time, give us a rating. Those one or two sentences reviews go a long way to helping others find us. I will see you in two weeks. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from theheart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.